everyone, and welcome to the NINDS Pain Therapeutics Development Program Webinar, PTDP. We will start off with a presentation of slides followed by questions and answers. Please submit your questions in the Q&A section be feature below, and they will be answered at the end of the presentation by our team. This presentation will be recorded and placed on our YouTube page in the upcoming days. I will be sending that link along with the presentation slides to everyone that has registered. Please keep your mics muted for the duration of the presentation, as well as keeping your video off. I will now turn over to our pres presenter for today, Dr. Jim Pomonis. Thank you, Rakonda. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. So today, uh, as part of this webinar, we're going to talk about the Heal Pain Therapeutics Development Program, or PTDP for short. Uh, brief agenda, we'll, I'll start talking about uh, how PTDP fits in with the broader HEAL initiative, a little bit about the structure of PTD program, how it, how it functions once a grant has been awarded, and then we'll end off talking about ampli ap grant application details and some considerations. So as you're probably aware, the HEAL initiative, uh, the goal of that is to speed scientific solutions to the opioid crisis. And one step in that process has been to promote and help advance the discovery and development of novel therapeutics for analgesia. Um, and so you can see in this slide where the PTDP fits in, in the middle of this bar. So it, it encompasses a pretty broad section of the research and development process from late discovery all the way through phase one clinical trials. And that's obviously where I'm gonna spend most of my time talking today, but there are a few other programs to be aware of. Um, and keep this in mind as you're listening to the, the criteria for PTDP today, because there are a few programs, if you find yourself where you're at in your pro programs, um, not quite ready to enter PTDP. There are a couple of programs of note that may be uh, of value to you. Uh, the first is studies to enable analgesic discovery. We'll talk about that next. And then also um, there are some programs at NCATS that I'm not going to um, talk about, but there's also the preclinical screening platform for pain, PSPP, and I'll talk briefly about that. And then of course, to, to kind of continue on the spectrum of R&D, for pain therapeutics, there are programs for later phase clinical to phase two clinical trials, such as EpicNet. So the studies to enable analgesic discovery program um, is a new, relatively new program. It's an R61, R33 mechanism. It's milestone driven phased award program. It is good for up to three years with a maximum of 350,000 direct costs per year. Supports small molecules, biologics, and natural products, and has a lot of activities that are involved that are responsive for these applications, including assay development and validation, screening for initial hit identification, in vitro characterization of hits and potential therapeutic agents, as well as preliminary pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamic, and efficacy studies for characterized agents. There's a webinar for this uh, next Tuesday, and you can scan that QR code to register. Um, and don't forget, these slides will be available to you later, so no need to scramble for your phones at this point. Um, if you have some questions, you can contact the program lead, Dr. Julia Bachman, and her contact info is down below. There are some upcoming receipt dates uh, in 2025, uh, first one being January 28th and the second, May 16th. The other program uh, that I wanted to mention is the Preclinical Screening Platform for Pain, or PSPP. Uh, PSPP provides a platform to identify and profile non-addictive, non-opioid therapeutics for pain. It is also responsive to biologics, small molecules, natural products, but also has um, the ability to test devices um, if that's feasible. Um, and what this program, which is pretty unique, what it does, um, it provides rigorous preclinical evaluation of assets in a suite of assays, both in vitro and in vivo. Um, those are performed by contract facilities uh, with psychogenics being uh, the contract holder. All this work is done in a blinded and confidential basis, and this is done at no cost to the participant. The PSP, PSPP staff interacts with the asset holder um, plan some of the testing, review the test results, and discuss future studies. And all this is done with confidentiality and intellectual property protected to you. 
This program is open to academic, industry, and government asset owners worldwide. And the program director is Smriti Ayengar, and her contact information is at the bottom. So moving on to the PTD program in particular. So as we talked about a couple slides ago, um, you know, the PTDP program covers a pretty broad swath in the R&D process, you know, from lead optimization all the way through first in human clinical trials. And the way we do this is actually a pretty interesting and unique uh, mechanism where we have kind of multiple sources of, of support and funding. One part is your traditional grant funding, uh, so direct, direct costs going to the PI and their institution. Um, this, these funds are designed to support the PI-directed research activities, things that are being done in their lab. And it also can be used for funding for CROs and consultants that are managed by the PI. So that's one source that comes with that grant. Then there are other two, two sources of funding that help drive progress in these projects. And they're almost like you know any other part of the world we'd call them in-kind uh, contributions. And so the NIH has a series of contracts with contract research organizations and consultants. And once that grant is awarded, you have access to these, to these contracts. So there's really a three-tiered uh, funding source. So when you look at the total value of your of the award, it's not just the direct cost going to the grant. The the value is is significantly greater in the, the costs that were that are paid to the contract research organizations and consultants. And so because this is a cooperative agreement, these these three are all managed through a project team and we call the lead development team and we'll talk about that in the next slide. But this is a multi multidisciplinary team involving the PI and and their team as well as NIH staff and the consultants that are hired, as well as members from the contract research organizations um, that are participating in these projects. So if we wanna look at this from kind of an organizational perspective, you could consider a PTDP program as a virtual pharma. Um, and that's kind of what we found to be the best analogy to how this functions, where the lead development team, which as I said, is composed of the principal investigator, the industry seasoned consultants, and the NIH staff um, form really the core team that direct all research activities. Um, as an aside, the, the consultants that we have available uh, have expertise in assay development, medicinal chemistry, CMC or chemistry manufacturing controls, PKDM, so pharmacokinetics and drug metabolism, as well as pharmaceutical development. And so these, this team, the LDT, manages the NIH grant, how the, how the PI is spending that money in their lab to conduct their bioactivity and efficacy studies. And then the contracts cover the remainder or can cover the remainder of the activities that are required. So we have contracts with uh, CROs that are working in medicinal chemistry, pharmacokinetics, toxicology, data management, manufacturing and formulation. And you can see the current contract holders there below. So again, the PTDP program supports biologic and small molecule therapeutic development. The NIH consultants are assigned and tailored to each project based on needed expertise. So you, you may or may not have any or you know all of the consultants representing all of these areas shown on the right. You may have one or two or, or more than that, just depending on what the project needs are. And they may, like, may come and go depending on the phase of the project. Uh, NIH contract resources are also tailored to the stage of the project. And that is done in part by how you, how you prepare your grant application. So as you prepare your grant application, you will need to specify which contracts uh, will be used there, or that you will require for your work. Now, for instance, if you pick, you say that you need support from NIH contracts for pharmacokinetic studies, you don't get to pick which CRO is awarded the contract, but you can simply state that you will use NIH contractors for the PK work. And again, remember that um, as we go through this whole process, the PI team's intellectual property is retained by the PI's institution. So this has led to what we feel has been a pretty successful endeavor. Um, and this approach um, is flexible enough to cover a modality, a broad range of modalities and targets. You can see a little bit over half of our programs to date have been in small molecules. A very large chunk have been in biologics, and we've had a couple um, that have been combination products as well as reformulation activities. On the outer ring of that pie chart on the left, you can see the targets that have been uh, studied. 
Now, not all of these programs are still active. Some of them have been closed out. But we've had a couple that are currently uh, beginning phase one clinical trials. So we've had some good success driving, driving these programs all the way through to the end. These, pro these targets cover a broad range of target types, GPCRs, ion channels, um, membrane proteins, and enzymes. So let's move on to the uh, grant process itself. I'm starting off with what, el what organizations are eligible. PTDP is open to academic institutions, small businesses, as well as organizations with foreign components. And the organizations with foreign components is something that um, is worth looking into a little bit. If that applies to you, you'll need to understand what the definition of foreign components are. That's in the paragraph there that I'm not going to read. Um, it used to be that foreign institute PIs at a foreign institution could apply for PTDP, but that has changed in the last year. So the PTDP uh, PI must be uh, within the US. Um, so foreign components, though, you need to be aware of these. They are any collaboration with investigators at a foreign site anticipated to result in co-authorship. Um, the use of facilities or instrumentation at a foreign site or any receipt of financial support or resources from a foreign entity. And it's worth noting that foreign travel for consultation or meetings is not considered a foreign component. So the features of the grant itself, um, oops, excuse me, are that it is a phased milestone driven cooperative agreement. And this is this is unique. It's, it's not like an R01 or any of those more common grants that we have. Um, we'll talk a lot uh, coming up about milestones. They're very important. Um, and as I said before, this is a cooperative agreement. That's where we get to the, the kind of cross-functional LDT that involves both NIH staff as well as the PI and then the, the consultants and CROs that are involved. The grant supports the early therapeutic development process, including hit-to-lead activities, lead optimization, selection and characterization, biomarker optimization and PKPD development, and all the way through to IND enabling studies in phase one trials. With those in mind, the end goals and milestones for the project for the program are to identify and fully characterize a lead candidate, to identify target engagement biomarker if possible, to seek partnerships. And a note on that, the, the NIH does not work with the PI to, to find and, and you know maintain or create those partnerships, but that is strongly encouraged. You know, the end goal of, of this whole program is to bring a therapy to the clinic and that commercialization is very important in order to do that. And those partnerships are almost always key to, um, to eventual commercialization. Um, also the goals are to complete IND enabling studies and file the IND, and then ultimately completing phase one trials so that you are ready for a phase two clinical trial. So, as I said before, the program is, is fairly flexible um, in terms of where it is, and that's representative of the broad, uh, you know, swath covered by, of the research and development spectrum covered by the program. So, there are many different entry points that you can, that you can come in. So, you can come in in a discovery or in a development phase, uh, with the discovery being exploratory, hit to lead or lead optimization, and the development phase being IND enabling studies and phase one studies. But, you know, kind of a, along with that, this grant, as we said before, is a phased mechanism. And the two phases are what we call UG3 and UH3 phases. Together, these two uh, phases are a maximum of five years. They're both part of the single application. Your UG3 phase can be no more than two years, and the UH3 phase can be uh, the remainder of the five years. So it can either be uh, three or four years. But your application must have both the UG3 and UH3 activities in the application budget. And because of this, um, it's, it's really important that in your application, you're able to lay out a clear path to the clinic using your funds, the grant funds, or the NIH contracts and combination of the two. And this, is, this can be challenging if you're, if you're new to this process and we can happily discuss how your program is uh, I'm going to use most effectively use the resources available to the grant to get to get all the way through to phase one. The entry criteria 
for discovery or development stage are obviously different. If you're coming in at the discovery stage, you'll need to demonstrate that you have a, biolog a rigorous biological rationale for the intended approach, a promising small molecule or biologic starting point for optimization. So we're not looking for a hit, you at least have a hit and we uh, later on maybe even have a lead. You have scientifically sound assays to optimize and test the target. And then if you have completed all that prior to your application, you want to come in at the development phase, you would have a candidate therapeutic that is already identified. We'll have a strong data package linking modulation of the therapeutic target by candidate therapeutic to disease modification. And you'll have biological activity and admet properties of candidate therapeutic that are appropriate for the intended use. So let's dig into those different phases a little bit more. So, the UG3 phase and the UH3 phase, um, you know, they're, they're not the same as the discovery and development phase. The UG3 phase is the preparatory phase. And the UH3 phase is the execution phase. And you'll, you'll, try and, you'll work to transition from one phase to the next. Um, the activities that are covered in the UG3 phase are the optimization using potency and efficacy screens, preliminary efficacy and toxicology testing and appropriate animal, model, animal models for pain. And that's very important. This will, you know, that is one aspect of the program that is not covered by any of our NIH contracts. So that work will either need to be covered in your direct cost for work done in your own facility or laboratory, or you will need to find a contract or a partner to perform those studies. Uh, you'll also need characterization and testing for in vitro ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And there will be initial optimization of pharmacodynamic and target engagement biomarkers associated with the therapeutic or target pathway. You know, we're not necessarily looking for pain biomarkers. That's obviously a bit of the holy grail, but we uh, really strongly um, encourage, if at all possible, to find some sort of biomarker that demonstrates target engagement. And we found these to be really um, helpful in clinical trials and in, and in the development pathway as well. As we move into the execution phase, the activities that are covered in there are typically any further optimization activities as listed on the left, if required. Uh, PK, biodistribution, gene expression, tumor genicity, and immunogenicity assessments. Uh, if appropriate, cell bank development and testing. Formulation and manufacturing for toxicology and human clinical studies. These are, these are areas where the NIH contracts are almost always used. And, you know, almost nobody has the ability to, to do that kind of formulation and manufacturing. So that's a that's a big help for these processes that use the NIH contracts for that. Similarly, uh, contracts are often used for IND enabling characterization of the clinical candidate, non-GLP and GLP toxicology studies, and IND submission as well as phase one clinical testing. So another important feature as you to, to keep in mind as we go from UG3 to UH3 is that there is a review. That is a, a, a checkpoint um, and that is uh, key milestones need to be met in order to transition from the UG3 to the UH3. So as you receive an award, you are not guaranteed funding for the UG3 and the UH3 phase. You, it is a, that's where we call this a phase mechanism. In order to go from one phase to the next, you need to meet the milestones that are set for advancement. So at the end of the UG3 phase, NIH program staff and leadership will determine if the project will advance the UH3 phase, and they'll also conduct an annual administrative review. These reviews will be based on successful achievement of milestones. And again, we'll talk about milestones here in a little bit. The overall feasibility of the project advancement, including biomarker work and considering data that may not have been captured in milestones. So if you've done extra work, you want to give you credit for that. Um, competitive landscape for the disease indication and drug target, right? The, the, the armamentarium that the physicians have to treat pain is constantly changing, whether new drugs are approved or, or drugs that have been approved or are no longer marketed or your approval is removed. Um, that can make your, your potential candidate uh, more or less attractive and more or less commercializable. Uh, program priorities and availability of funds, of course, are always uh, the reality of, of the funding world. So there are a couple uh, few mistakes that can be made during the application process that will lead to an unfortunate uh, withdrawal of your application. So I'd like to talk about some of those because we want to make sure that you avoid those mistakes in your in your application.
first is screening for initial hit identification. And those, those activities are not covered in PTDP, and that's where you want to look at something like the earlier, um, earlier of the grant mechanisms that we talked about. Basic research studies and studies of disease mechanism are not covered by PTDP. Again, this is a research and development grant, so we need to really work focus on a candidate therapeutic and getting that to market. Animal model development simil similarly is not supported by this, nor our development of diagnostics and diagnostic devices. Similarly, clinical studies beyond phase one are not supported. And perhaps most importantly, projects that are designed to look at opioid sparing effects or projects targeting the new opioid receptor are uh, will not be reviewed. Another reason for application withdrawal uh, is incomplete applications. So please make sure that you have uh, everything required and make sure that you are not missing any of the following. Go no go milestones. So as we talked about the transition from the UG3 to UH3, there are some critical ones there, but there are also several milestones that will be uh, in place throughout the whole life cycle of the program. You'll need a target product profile table activities for both the UG3 or the preparatory phase, as well as the UH3 execution phase, a budget for each year of the proposed project, including both of the UG3 and UH3 phases. And you'll also need an intellectual property plan attachment. Again, because we are looking to bring something to market and commercialize that intellectual property is a real key factor in successful commercialization. So we've talked a lot about milestones. Um, you know, the absence of milestones can lead to an application withdrawal. Poor milestones can lead to uh, poor score. And milestones are really critical throughout the life of the project. So let's, let's talk a little bit about those. So we said they must be included in the grant application. So they, you need to understand what they are and include good ones into your in your application. They're used for measuring success, right? This is this is how we determine the successful project during its life cycle. And the success has to be focusing on achieving each of the research plan's key objectives. For each of your key objectives in your application, make sure you have at least one and probably more than that milestone for each objective. For each milestone, you should provide details on methods, assumptions, experimental designs, and data analysis plans and specify the quantitative criteria for measuring success and related rationale. These quantitative criteria should be robust and be consistent with state of the art in the field. Further, the quantitative criteria for success in the milestones will be used for making go, no go decisions, and this should be specified. And these are why you know, you'll need to put in a lot of effort into these milestones, make sure they're very rational, well thought out, and they're, they're going to be the key to continued success should your application be funded. Finally, specify the timeline for each milestone, and there must be at least one milestone each year. Importantly, these milestones will be further refined after award with NIH staff and the whole lead development team. So while they're required in your application, be aware that what you, what you, the milestones that you submit with your application will likely not be the milestones that will be finalized for your project. And they can be also further refined during the life life cycle of the project. And for those of you that have ever uh, worked uh, in a job where you've had performance reviews based on goals and objectives, you're probably familiar with the SMART acronym for SMART objectives, which are specific, achievable, measurable, relevant, and time-bound. And uh, you can apply that rationale as you write milestones, right? You want to make these milestones clear and objective enough so that anybody uh, in the project or outside of the project could, could look at the progress and look at the milestone and come to the same conclusion. Intellectual property, important throughout, throughout this process. Um, inventorship is determined per US patent law. Keep that in mind. Uh, the PTDP in the NIH in general has no stake in intellectual property that always retain, is retained by the PI and any, any other uh, co-holders of the, of the IP. And along those lines, make sure that prior to your grant award, um, the PI institution has upfront IP agreements in place with all potential investors. And these agreements must address who will hold title to IP on any new chemical matter or biologic or use and any royalty arrangements. 
Make sure that your IP agreements aim for unencumbered IP consistent with the PTDP program to create a licensable product. If there's, you know, lack of clarity around your IP, the path to commercialization is much more challenging. So that's why that is important. A few final check marks for you as you go through your application. Make sure that your application has the following. Separate budgets for each year of the grant. So for a five-year grant, you will have five separate budgets, and then you'll also have a cumulative budget sheet. Clearly indicate within a table which activities will be conducted by the PI and the associated personnel. So those are funded by your direct costs, and which will activities will be conducted by NIH contract research organizations and our consultants. So as we said earlier, you want to lay out the clear path to the clinic. As part of that pathway, you should have an understanding of what will be done in the PI's lab or under the exact PI's control and what will be required of the NIH resources. If you indicate that you'll use some of these NIH contracts or resources, do not include that in the budget. If you're using your own subcontractor or subaward, that should be included in your budget. Please include a table of proposed activities that provides the following information. The activity, such as optimization effort or in vivo or in vitro assays, pharmacokinetics, et cetera, what the throughput of those assays are or those activities are, so how many samples per month, the source, and sort of where's that done in the PI's lab, a subawardee or an NIH contractor, and then what are the advancement criteria? Again, include a target product profile table. Make sure to address the intellectual property in the other attachment section. And then as we get into the clinical trial part of your application, if you are asking the NIH to conduct the clinical trial under the NIH contracts, uh, which is most common, um, then you want to mark your application clinical trial equals no. Even though the clinical trial is a part of the application that is being you know, effectively managed by the NIH, so that's why that is marked no. However, if you are planning to subcontract or conduct your own clinical trial, you'll indicate that this will be a delayed onset clinical trial and you'll need to follow the special instructions for the information required. And finally, make sure that your application has a data sharing and management plan that complies with the HEAL guidelines and the NIH data and management sharing policy. Some other things you'll want to do. Um, you know, this is good advice for any grant that you're going to uh, apply for, but read the funding opportunity announcement carefully. There's a lot of information in there, but uh, if it says to do something, make sure it's done. And if it says not to do something, please don't. Do discuss your proposal with the NIH. Program directors are a great resource for this. Marianne Pellmounter, who's joining us today, is the program director for PTDP. She and any of the, our other staff are happy to sit down and talk with, your, with you about your program. Obviously, uh, with the broad scope and flexibility that we have for PTDP, um, everything that comes in is unique and um, lots of questions come up ahead of time and we're happy to answer them. Remember to stick to your page limit. Um, I believe that for research strategy, page limit is usually 12 pages, but whatever it says in the funding opportunity announcement, uh, stick to that. For your scientific premise, you want to make sure to explicitly discuss the quality of the data presented in prior publications in a detailed manner. Um, make sure that you have done a thorough and critical review of the, the data that are used to support your premise and talk about the strengths and weaknesses of that in your application. Rigor is obviously very important in your application. And one thing that is kind of, in a way, really important, it's you know important research in general, but it's a very common um, critique of R&D projects is, is appropriate controls. So make sure that you're using appropriate positive and negative controls for all studies and detail those in your application. Also highlight any potential confounds such as surgery exposure, genotype, culture to culture variability and human placebo effects. Um, further, you know, you want to include enough details about the experimental design to, that, that address questions of potential bias, details such as blinding and randomization and inclusion and exclusion criteria. Please also describe the source of the data on which the sample size estimation or power analysis is based and the details about the analysis itself. Statistics are obviously very important as we make decisions uh, about the data and go no-go. So having uh, quality data to start with and quality statistics are going to be key for that. Additionally, 
Um, if, you, if at all possible, you want to make sure to complete your required registrations at least six to eight weeks in advance of the receipt dates. That can take some time to do that, so definitely not something you want to wait till the last minute on. If at all possible, and I know this is hard, not how we usually write grants, but consider submitting your application early. Uh, this gives you a chance to react to any issues that might come up and result in your application being withdrawn prior to the application date. Uh, discuss your budget with the NIH staff if you have any questions or any other questions that you need to discuss with NIH staff. Again, we're happy to help with that. And then internally on your end, you might want to make sure to talk with your tech transfer business development group, especially because you'll need a plan for funding patents and licensing activities. There's some important no-nos and things not to do here. Um, importantly, do not plan for this to be the sole funding for your lab. This is a milestone driven program and funding for that can end abruptly, even though you, you know, have the possibility of a five year award, it could last one, two or three years along the way. And um, some of the, you know, programs that have been discontinued uh, are not because there is no, no path forward, but milestones were not met and uh, efforts have to be reset, redone. So we, you know, anything that, that falls off our, our program list, we, we really hope that those efforts can continue and get back to a point where they can potentially re-enter the program. And if the PTDP is the only funding for that, that's obviously not possible. Don't forget to address the use of NIH contract resources, um, but use them appropriately, right? So do not plan to use NIH contracts for disease biology. Don't include the NIH contracts in your application budget. Simply state what contracts you will need to do, but those do, are not factored into your budget for your direct costs. Similarly, and because of that, do not reach out to planned NIH contractors for letters of support. And this is the last slide. Um, we have some important uh, folks here to, uh, that can help address many of your questions and contact information. Marianne Pellamounter is our program lead for PTDP. Uh, Chuck Sywin is the Director of Small Molecule Neurotherapeutic Development and is heavily involved in PTDP as well. Rakonda Medley, who's on the call today, is our Operations Coordinator and is a great resource for, for helping you find the right people to talk to or other resources that you may need. Um, there are a number of other, even though PTDP is housed within uh, NINDS, we work frequently with other institutes and centers within the NIH based on certain diseases that, uh, that may be affected. So we have a lot of expertise in other biology areas as well. And then our program staff uh, that work, you know, pretty much full time on PTDP are Mohamed Hashisha, Pascal Lang, Rosa O'Neill Mathurin, Candler Page, Marianne, myself, Shamsi Raisi, Ranga Wargarjan, and Matthew Rice. And the link in the QR code at the bottom. Uh, we'll get you to the PTDP website, and there, there's some more information that you can find there. Um, our next receipt dates are um, January 24th uh, next year, May 23rd, and September 24th of next year. And with that, we'll uh, turn it over to some questions. Thanks, Jim. For those that joined in late, please submit your questions in the chat section below. And this is being recorded, so you will get a copy of this presentation. Yes, the, um, the slides will be shared via email. Okay, here's a question. If the technology has already been licensed to a startup company, are we still eligible to apply? Yes, um, you'll need, you know, you'll, you'll need to have some, some clear IP uh, agreements laid out in place, but as long as it meets uh, the entry criteria, uh, in terms of where it is in the development path, yes. Okay, next question is, can you comment on the scope of NIH contract support and how we can practically determine it, determine it example, how many chemists? Um, so the, the FTE allocation is 
uh, based just kind of as needed and 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 within budget limits from you know what what funding we have available for that in the year you know we those the number of chemists that will work on a project shifts over time depending on the resources you know it can be a handful a couple up to you know six to eight something like that so there have been pretty pretty large teams that have done a lot of um, structure activity relationship activities so we've been able to generate a, a pretty large number of compounds you know nothing like uh, you're as if you were working for big pharma but uh, we've been able to generate a very large number of compounds for screening and lead optimization. And we're, you know, okay. if you've got concerns about that and you want to talk to us about where you're at with your program, we're we're happy to do that offline. Okay. Julia, could I just uh, add one thing to the question about if the technology has been licensed? to a startup company, are you eligible to apply? I would suggest, um, I think it's Dr. Parikh, that you maybe uh, contact uh, me or Jim or someone on our team because this will depend on the details of this. Because remember, we want the grantee to be able to commercialize the product. So it'll just depend on where that intellectual property actually stands relative to the grantee. Okay. Yeah, sure thing. I'll reach out. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Next question is what kind of budget limits are there for this grant? Marion, you want to take that one? Yeah. So there in, if you, when you look at the funding opportunity um, announcement, you'll see that there actually are no uh, budget limits specified. So instead, um, one of the things that review looks at is whether the budget is realistic for what you're proposing. And that can mean uh, sometimes people don't put enough in their budget to actually get the work done. Other times they're adding things that are not necessary, at least in terms of what we specifically cover. So it's, it's more of a judgment um, on the part of our reviewers and our program staff. Okay, the next question, if the proposed active agent has new opioid activity, but is delivered in a manner that does not result in functional activity in vivo, is it still outside of the scope of this RFA? Um, that depends, <laughs> not to uh, avoid that answer. I, if it's not the primary mechanism of action and it can demonstrate that there are no in vivo activities, there's potentially a path forward, but I think that's probably best discussion to be had offline. Okay. Sounds like I have a lot of things to discuss with you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Set up a call. We'll, we'll happily get into we'll the do. details. We'll do. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next question. Does funding depend on institutional pay lines or availability of funds through the Hill Initiative? How are the funds distributed amongst institutes? Does the funding run out prior to the end of the fiscal year? So uh, if you want me to do that, I can take yeah. a stab at that. <laughs> um, so funding, so, so first of all, this is a congressionally mandated program. And so f there is a certain amount of money that is available for this. And so it doesn't really depend so much on institutional pay lines themselves. It's more the overall funding at, for the entire HEAL program, at least as it relates to the pain management aspect of it. Remember, there are two aspects. One's, to, one's for addiction, which NIDA takes care of, and the other one is for pain management, which is up to NINDS uh, in terms of managing it. Um, so the funds are distributed uh, based on, I think, more than anything else, the history of grants that are funded through each of the institutes, because all of the institutes that are listed on this last slide actually participate in this program, too. 
Um, and in terms of funding can run out, but we have, we try very hard. We have not had that happen yet, in other words. So we're very careful about looking at um, making sure that our budgets are realistic and that, you know, in cases of programs like this where they're milestone driven, just making sure that if milestones aren't met, then there is the potential for programs not to have their out years. I hope that helps. Okay, next question is, can you provide more details about the review process? I'm not sure if it's something um, specific. Right, that's what I wasn't sure of either. Uh, but in any case, so the reviewers, if you're trying to understand what type of expertise is on the panel of reviewers, um, that expertise is pretty it's pretty diverse because we're looking at therapeutics development. So we have people with expertise in both on the both the preclinical and clinical side of pain biology. But then we also have expertise in the drug development piece. So we have uh, people with expertise in medicinal chemistry. We have uh, people with expertise in the development of biologics um, and also um, like I would say in uh, pharmacokinetics, um, toxicology, things like that. Each time we have a review panel, the SRO, the, the scientific review officer who leads the panel, looks very carefully at what's in the applications. And so many times those review panels are tailored to the applications themselves so that we don't miss anything. So hopefully that helps. And usually, uh, it, it's you get about five reviews, so about five discussants are assigned to your particular application, even though the whole panel votes on it. And uh, you get very detailed suggestions in your summary statement from those five discussants. So it, let me know if there's any other specific things you were interested in asking about that. Okay. Give it a couple more minutes for any more questions. Okay, it looks like that's about it. Again, thank you everyone for join, joining us. And you have all of the contact information if you want to reach out. You can reach out to me if you want meetings set up between you and anybody from the team. Um, until next time, have a safe and blessed Thanksgiving. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.